El Dakrori Mountain is a very famous mountain in Siwa Oasis. It's a place which holds a lot of history, pharaonic history, as well as Islamic history. This place is called Tourism Location Festival Place, where the people of Siwa comes annually to celebrate a special religious Islamic festival. In that festival, they stay here for some days, and then they go back to the city. So they use this place only once a year, but it holds a very important significance for the people of the oasis. The tomb of Sidi Suleiman, which lies next to the new mosque in the wide square of Siwa city, is considered the most glorified places in Siwa. That's due to the fact that Sidi Suleiman is the father of walis or saints for the Syrians, in whom they believe in sanctity and his miraculous abilities. Celebrating his birthday comes after harvesting the seeds, and it seems that this festival came to replace two old feasts, which don't have religious characters. They are Ashura feast and an ancient harvest feast. But in reality, celebrating his birthday falls within all the common elements of all previous festivals. Today's festival is also called the Harvest Feast or the Tourism Feast. Each year, when the two main cultivations of the oasis, the dates and the olives are ripe enough to be harvested in October, the celebrations start. According to the oasis rituals, a special type of bread is baked and it's called El Mugardag and is collected from the houses by those volunteers who serve the mosque situated in each suburb. An amount of money is collected too. Then most people, young and old, leave to El Dakrur mountain to stay for three days. The mountain is chosen due to its history in being used in an ancient feast. In that feast, the Syrians used to spend few nights at the time of the full moon of Ragab Islamic month in tents at the foot of El Dakrur mountain. They considered their staying there a vacation in which every man and woman ate as much garlic as possible, thinking that it will provide them with good health throughout the year. This habit is no longer followed as it merged into the rituals of celebrating Sidi Solomon feast and its core of beliefs which needed also rituals of its own. After the defeat of the king of Persia in Assos in 333 BC, and to protect himself from the danger of the powerful Persian fleet in the Mediterranean, Alexander the Great initiated the invasion of all the marine ports in Syria and Palestine, then invaded Egypt, which fell without a fight when Mazazes the Persian Wali surrendered Memphis fortress with its garrison and safe. Alexander was actually welcomed by the Egyptians with joy as they regarded him the liberator from the cruel Persian rule. The Egyptian priests in Memphis acknowledged the Macedonian invader as a king over Egypt. Special rituals were performed in the temple of Katbitah, where Alexander presented offerings to him and other gods, as he knew that nothing has upset the Egyptians like the killing of Ochos to the Abyss bull and the disrespect which Kambiz showed towards him. In fact, the respect which Alexander has shown towards the Egyptian gods and the offerings he presented were not fake ways to reach out to them, but that tendency was a real distinctive characteristic of that great leader. In the first middle of 331 BC, and after Alexander established the city of Alexandria, he headed towards Siwa. That visit wasn't only the most famous visit in the ancient history, but beyond doubt it was a main event 
that immortalized the name of Siwa Oasis in both the ancient and modern times. Since the 8th century BC, and even before that, Egypt was well known for the Greeks, as many of the writers wrote in the 6th and 5th and 4th centuries about Egypt, and many of their celebrities who founded the principles of the Greek civilization bragged about teaching their students in Greece what was taught to them by the Egyptian priests. Since the 8th century BC, a Greek trade center was established in Nocrates in Western Delta, and hence many Greek traders established good routes for trade with Egypt. On the other hand, many Greek philosophers came to Egypt to study in the schools attached to the temples. Amongst them was Solon the Athenian, and Lindos, and Kipolos, and Phales, and Miletos, and the famous Pythagoras and Platon, who stayed in Egypt for a long time, and later worked on spreading the famosity of the Egyptian wisdom. By these communications, it became settled in the minds of the Greeks that Egypt is a cradle of philosophy and Sufism, and music, and sculpture and arts in general. In the same time, Amun's temples spread in the Greek cities, and in Athens, they celebrated the opening of a temple consecrated to Amun in 333 BC, which was less than two years of the visit of Alexander to the Temple Oracle of Siwa. designs of pottery in Egypt makes us impressed with the progress the Egyptian has made throughout their 7,000 years of civilization. They have totally mastered this magnificent art, producing pottery of various designs and colors, which makes Egypt really unmatched in the whole world today in producing pottery. The historical sources of the ancient Egyptian history are known and validated like the recordings of Maniton el Samanudi and Karnak List and the writings of Herodotus and the Papyri and others. But no doubt, pottery has played an important, undeniable role in dating the timings of the monumental sites accurately. For the handmade manufacturing of pottery varied in all of its aspects from one time zone to another starting from the dawn of history and stretching to almost the end of the ancient civilization. It's quite interesting to know that the pot shreds remaining from the pharaonic times kept existing side by side to the other eras that followed, like the Islamic period and its monuments. The Nile, stretching 6,671 kilometers in the African lands ending in Egypt, was a prime cause of the civilization of the mother country of all civilizations. With the Nile came the flood annually to submerge the cultivated lands with a black silt. The Egyptians knew the true values of their black treasure, for it was the natural fertilizer of their green land, so precious that God Osiris, being the god of cultivation, besides being the god of the dead, was represented sometimes in green or black color. But that was not the only function of the silt. In fact, it served an equally important purpose a purpose that was a mark of history itself. The best examples of the marriages that took place in ancient Egypt between the king and the commoner woman, who didn't have a blue blood or nobility background, 
are the marriages of King Amenophis III and his wife T, and King Akhenaton and Nefertiti, and King Ramesses II and Nefertari, and others who bore the title of the great wife of the king, and had no royal origin, but when married became legal queens. Thus, a queen is a queen by the right of marriage, and the king is a king by the right of birth. Sometimes, the husband of the princess took the throne, like in the cases of Semen Khekara and Tutankhamun, but that happened in certain circumstances, which is the non-existence of a male inheritant to the dead king, that the kingship transfers to the husband of the daughter as a sort of connection between the current ruler and the preceding one. It's noticeable also that in case of the non-existence of a daughter, there was no problem in sitting on the throne. The king then chose one of his men, who was suitable for the throne, to take it after him. This was clearly shown in the choice of Hur Imheb to one of the greatest leaders in his army, who is Ramesses I, who established the 19th dynasty and had no actual relation with the 18th dynasty by relation or marriage. None of the Egyptian kings married his sister to add legitimacy to his throne. The king married after the death of his wife, just in need of a new wife, and not necessarily his sister. It was proved that the women of the royal family married the leaders of the army, and the rulers of the gnomes and the high officials of the country, and none of them was prohibited of marriage just to guarantee the continuity of the throne to the king after the death of his wife. If the king needed that, he would have married all his sisters together to guarantee the legitimacy of his throne forever, but that never happened. There is a belief that King Amenophis III and Queen Hatshepsut, whose divine births were pictured on the walls of Luxor Temple and Hatshepsut's temple, had presented these scenes to add legitimacy to their rule. These claims say that King Amunhotep III, by that, added legitimacy to his ruling, for he was a son of a secondary wife called Mutimoya, who never appeared on the monuments of her husband, Tutmosis IV, and was even considered by some a foreigner. Cleopatra Spring is the largest and biggest and most famous spring in Siwa Oasis. Many tourists come here to take a bath in its fresh cold water, by summertime and by wintertime as well. There are other springs in Siwa Oasis, but this one has got special qualities. The temperature of the water differs from day to night. During daytime, it's cold, and during nighttime, it's hot. The salinity of the groundwater is from 1,600 to 8,200 fraction of million and sometimes reaches 2,000 or 1,700 fraction of million in some areas in Siwa, like Dakrur lakes. The temperature of water is between 26 and 30 degrees Celsius. As for the second layer, which has very fresh water, like the one used in bottling water in Siwa and also used in the main water network. Its water source is from the Nubian sandstone layers and it lies at a depth of 600 meters to 1,500 meters below the ground. The percentage of salt in it is between 300 to 400 fraction of a million. This shows that some of the spring's water is unarable and unsuitable for irrigation due to its high level of salinity 
containing sodium and magnesium salt unless treated in a special way for some kinds of cultivation and plants. The rest of the springs in Siwa has a level of salinity between 1,700 and 2,000 fraction of million and thus are suitable for agriculture but need experience in irrigation and drainage. They are good for trees more than they are for vegetables. As for the fresh water, which is 300 to 500 fraction of a million, it's the best water to cultivate and drink. God Sobek is one of the most important ancient Egyptian gods who was worshipped in the shape of a crocodile for his cult goes back to the prehistoric era. The most ancient proofs of that god are reliefs of a ring from Tarkhan dating to the era of Narma and picturing Sobek sitting near his sanctuary. His cult was based in El Fayum since the first dynasty and he was mentioned in the pyramids text, being a son of goddess Neet. The cult of Gatsobek became prominent during the Middle Kingdom with the closeness of the new capital from El Fayum, for he was considered a protective god. When Gatsobek gained special importance during the Middle Kingdom, his name entered the compositions of the names of some of its kings, like Sobek, and Sobek Hotep, and thus due to the transport of the capital to Esetawi or El and the increase of care of El Fayum, which is considered one of the most important home locations of sanctifications of the crocodile in the Old Kingdom. The chapels of the cult of Gat Sobek spread in many places, but the two most important locations of his cult were within the area of Old Chedet, or today's modern Fayum, which was the residential area of the kings of the 12th dynasty. The second center of Gatsobek's cult was in Kobombo, in Upper Egypt, for he shared the temple with his wife Hathor and son Honso and the other god Hur, and he was the head of one of the two triads of Kobombo, composed of Sobek. Hathur, Khonso, and Hur. His cult continued throughout different periods until the Greek-Roman period. There are some local important centers of his cult which lie in El Jabalain and Jabal El Silsila or the Chain Mountain. His temples were usually supplied with the ponds and lakes with water to house the sacred animal, the crocodile, which was mummified after its death. God Amon took the shape of a human with his head topped by a crown of two perpendicular feathers. He could also appear in the figure of a complete ram, for the ram was the sacred shape of God Amon. Sometimes he takes the shape of Min, the god of fertility, and in other times, he takes the geese form. 